I'm going to begin to draw my design on the cast and start with the cingulum rest on the canine. I'm going to do all the preparation first and then do the adjustments. Cingulum rest on my central incisor. Remember the cingulum rest must cover the cingulum, a rounded chevron shape. Here are my two rests. They will each have a little bit of a sluice way because there'll be an arm or plating coming in each direction. Now, let me begin with the metal. We're going to have this wrought wire coming in this direction, so we will have a guide plate right here coming up. Guide plate comes up right behind that prominent part of the cusp. We don't want to take it farther forward because then metal would show when we butt, try to butt a tooth up against it. I'm going to cover that cingulum rest. It goes up to the contact point. It's scalloped, but it must cover the cingulum scallops up to the contact point. Now obviously this is partly determined by the occlusion of the opposing arch. And uh, we'll come again over this one. Now I'm going to plate this tooth and as you can see I have a relatively low survey line. Plating should ideally be in the middle of the tooth, middle third. And then I'm going to come up, come around this rest. And this becomes the superior border of my direct retainer. So the direct retainer theoretically should be all above the survey line in the first two thirds but I have a very high survey line, so I'm going to take my clasp where I would like it. There's a superior border. And then what I will do is come back and alter my tooth in that area. So I'm going to come back here with my arm, and then that arm becomes the guide plate right here, if you can see that. Now, I have gone below my, I can have a third of my direct retainer under the survey line. So I can have it under the survey line from here on to the undercut. But this is all below the survey line. So here's my survey line. I'm going to put a circle. The part, top part of that circle is above the survey line. The bottom part of that circle goes right below where I drew my major my uh, direct retainer. So I have a interference right through there and then I'm going to put some cross hatches to indicate that I have a interference in that area so that I know to go back and, and adjust that. My tube tooth will come forward like this. There will be an, like an external finish line coming this direction and it will also have a finish line coming in this direction. Now you want to make it large enough to put a, a, a premolar in there. But that one will become this border right here and it will go back, <clears throat> excuse me, and plate that molar. Again, no higher than the middle third and this is going to come down and become my major connector back in here. This tube tooth has a circle on the inside of it which sort of denotes the tube tooth and then out here I can write on there or I can I'll write in here my metal will come around this rest it comes from this guide plate it comes up it comes around this rest and this will become the superior border of my direct retainer on this side and I would like my direct retainer to be no higher than the middle third of this tooth so I'm going to come on back with my direct retainer and I'm going to grab my 01 undercut I'm going to come back and it will go down and become the guide plate that is the part of that tube tooth right there now, I actually have a conflict in that all of this, all of this is below the survey line in the direct retainer. Only the first, the terminal third can be under that survey line. 
only the terminal third can be below that survey line. So I'm going to draw a circle. One is right above the current survey line and the bottom of that circle is right below the survey line and it actually is an interference over to here. And I'm going to put my red marks, the slash marks in that circle indicating that I have an interference and I have to come back and adjust my tooth in that area. On this side, we're going to take our base attachment and our finish lines. We will come down at the distal lingual line angle of this canine. And we'll come down and we have to have those teeth set over the ridge. So we're going to leave enough room, we're going to parallel that ridge and leave enough room for uh, the tooth to be set in that area. And we're going to come back and we're not going to quite go into that hamular notch area. We're going to kind of end right here. Now I'm going to go ahead and draw my base and where it would be at this point. And my base would be coming over here. Now it's not going to go below that undercut that I have there because it would be standing out away from the tissues. And I'm going to come on back with my base. The base has to cover the tuberosity, all that tissue back there and the base has to go through my hamular notch, which it will do right to here. And it will come and finish off right there. That's going to be the back of my base, and it's drawn in the blue pencil to this point right here. My base will also come along here, and this is the external finish line, um, which you saw if you watched the previous, cat, uh, the previous film. Is this heavy area of metal this butt joint right here is the external finish line so we're drawing that external finish line and our acrylic will come right up to that and it will become a nice um, butt joint right there and you won't be able to see a transition between your framework that ledge won't be there it'll be smooth transition in addition there is another line on the tissue side, another butt joint, and that other butt joint will be the internal finish line. And it will come along here, and to show you that one, again, it's this butt joint that is on the inside of the framework right here, so that that acrylic forms a nice smooth junction there. So those are our internal and external finish lines. Now that we have that, we can go ahead and finish our, uh, our base attachment. And, and we're going to come up like this because we want this to form a nice butt joint with this metal. And we'll come along here. And usually, you don't want to carry your framework all the way over to here because normally, we have a problem of setting teeth and making them look like they're coming out of the tissues if we go too far. So from this finish line back just a little bit over the crest of the ridge, I'm going to come back with my base attachment right here and join. And if you notice, I kind of curve here so that this acrylic can butt up against right here. So in that area we'll have a lot of openings where acrylic can flow through there. And the last one will have a processing stop placed in that area. Now sometimes this is so prominent that we end up covering it all with metal. So our finish lines would be a little bit different if we were going to cover that all in metal. And uh, I'll show you that at the end if I get a chance. Now our major connector is going to swing from this point 
over to this point. And it does a little bit of an oblique action here, which patient doesn't like. You want to cross the palette perpendicular to the median palatal suture. So we might come back like this and then bring our metal back up to that point so that we cross the palette in this manner. Then the other thing is we have to have an 8 millimeter posterior bar, but we'd like to open this palette as much as possible. So we're going to place a hole in this area and our border is going to come forward here and we want this bar that's going to be up here to end right in, 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 in a place where the opening is um, becomes confluent, the metal becomes confluent with the rugae so that it doesn't seem too prominent in that area. So if this metal is coming back here and it ends right in front of that hump, it blends into that hump of tissue. Like this. Now, we don't want really any sharp corners, so this would be more rounded than that. And these would be more rounded. I don't know where my brain was here or rounded and I'm going to use my handy dandy eraser to get rid of those lines that I don't like. I want to get one of these. It's a, a Eurotool made in Germany and it's great for erasing on cast like this. It doesn't take too much of the cast away but it, by the same token, you can make changes on your cast very easily. So we're going to round those corners. And they are in that way. This border here should be down far enough that we don't interfere with the tongue coming in this position. And we could actually maybe have come down at this point, And it would have been less interfering with the tongue making the speech, the S and the TH sounds in that area. Got to be careful not to erase my little, this little horizontal line, which was my. Now, last thing too, we have a wrought wire clasp on this tooth. And that wrought wire clasp is soldered back a ways, because if it's soldered too close to the junction right here where it begins, that clasp becomes a lot more brittle. And so it comes up this guide plate area here and then comes forward. And again, we want it to be no higher than the middle third. And it's going to come up and grab our 0.02 undercut and hopefully swing up a little bit like a J-shaped. That our wrought wire is drawn as a single line. It's not an outlined form. We can write wrought wire right here to tell the laboratory technician that we're going to have a wrought wire clasp in that area. Now, all of that clasp is below our survey line, so we're going to alter our tooth through this amount of area. We're going to alter our tooth. We're going to circle where the survey top border is where the survey line is now. Bottom border is where we're trying to move it. And we're going to uh, alter the tooth in that position. We don't have any interferences with guide plates because our survey line's real low on those teeth. If that survey line were up at the border here, at the marginal ridge, then we would alter that position also. The cingulum rest is a chevron shape. It's approximately a millimeter 
into the tooth, but we don't want any undercuts on that tooth right in that area. No undercuts. So there we have our cingulum rest. It's a positive seat, won't slip off. And then over here, we're going to lower our survey line on that tooth. So just to see how much we're going to have to remove on the patient, we kind of practice it on our diagnostic cast. And when I resurvey it now, I'm okay through that first half of the class. So my survey line is down here now. So I'm just going to replace my red circle to remind me where I have to do some work. But that one is, is altered already and I'm going to replace my cingulum rest right here to remind me to cut that one. I'm going to go ahead and prepare a cingulum rest on this central incisor. I would probably do this um, with an end cutting burr. You can use the 35 inverted cone or you can use an end cutting tapered diamond. Got to get rid of any undercuts after I take off that area of create a ledge there so you can possibly see this a little bit closer. I'll redraw that rest. Kind of a chevron shape and then our major connector has to be above it and it will scallop. You don't want it to be like a hump over that area. All right, we move back to our rest, and as our rule states, from a rest standpoint, you really need to know what the occlusion's like on the opposing tooth, but we'll remove a minimum of a millimeter, about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half. They the text basically says a millimeter and a half at the marginal ridge to make room for that metal. But then you also have to make sure that this rest is a positive seat. So this point has to be deeper than at the marginal ridge. And then you don't want any steep walls, so you're going to have to shape this more like a spoon shape. Take off those real steep walls. And then in the mouth, you would have to check the occlusion to make sure you have clearance. And I sometimes will do that with a piece of rope wax or red rope wax. Have the patient vaseline the teeth a little bit. Have the patient bite down and see whether or not there's enough thickness of wax in that area. So I think I've got this one prepared. And I'm going to redraw my brown around it. When I come to the facial of the tooth, that survey line is very high. So we're going to lower the survey line. I have the red line marked up here. I'm going to take off some of the contour of that tooth. Angle it backwards a little bit to bring my clasp arm down. This gives you a good idea of how much you're going to have to remove on that actual tooth while you're doing that. So it's a good exercise to do this on the, on the cast. And we'll resurvey it, make sure we have in fact lowered our survey line down. And we have. You may have to sometimes survey it and cut again. So our direct retainer will be coming around like this. And again, just as a reminder, I'm going to put that red circle back there 
with the hatch marks to indicate that I'm going to move that survey line down. If we had a guide plate that had to be adjusted, we would adjust the guide plate first because when we're adjusting this rest and you're taking that guide plate in somewhat, then that shortens this area in here and if you already made your deepest point, it may be right back at the, the uh, marginal ridge. And so you definitely want to do the guide plate first. All right, I don't like this survey line, so we're going to lower it a bit. So I need to adjust the facial of this tooth to be able to bring that clasp arm down. Again, I'd probably be doing this with a tapered diamond. Remember I talked about how high our .01 undercut was on the tooth? Depending on how much and how thick that tooth is, you might want to try and lower your survey line a little bit more in that posterior area and recreate a better undercut. Now you have to look at your tooth and determine whether or not you know that is acceptable to do. If you had a very large alloy that came all the way out into here, if you take away more of that uh, tooth surface, you'll, you'll have some problems. I'm going to re-survey that tooth. See if I've moved my survey line down, which I have. But now, I don't know where the one undercut is. I put my undercut gauge back in there, go back down, pull up, make a mark, okay. put red in that area, and now you can see that I have moved that, that O1 undercut more to the cervical third instead of having it way up like it was before. So I can now draw that direct retainer arm in a more favorable position. It has to be all above the survey line in the first half to two-thirds and then I'll go under, grab that undercut right there. To remember what I did, I'm going to put some red and some hatch marks to remember and explain where I'm going to be making that adjustment. I'm going to go ahead and adjust this additional rest in this area. I have re-prepared that tooth and I lowered my marginal ridge a millimeter and a half and I have the internal portion deeper than the marginal ridge and I'm going to go ahead and color it in. It's spoon shaped. I don't have terribly steep walls in this area. And again, you would have to, I've made a sluice way toward the lingual and toward the buckle. So I color that in, draw my metal around the rest. So here's our final design. I've cleaned it up a little bit. Um, you want to avoid doing too much scratching on the cast if it's your master cast. This is basically what we have. So we end up with all the red indicating where we're going to work on our, our patient in the future. And this is our design. I put WW out there, yeah. TT, okay. Just a reminder, major connector is in brown, or any of the metal is in brown. Finish lines the external finish line is in brown. The internal finish line is in blue. Rests are drawn in red. Tripoding is a red line through our mark and made into a cross and then circled in blue. Adjustments that we're going to make on the teeth are done in red. And usually the top of the circle is where the survey line is now. The bottom of the circle is where you would like to move the survey line.